Friends, good morning. There should be uh, coming out here momentarily some handouts <clears throat> like we've had the last couple of weeks uh, to help follow along in the study we're doing on the ministry of the church and uh, hope those are a help to you as we, as we study. They're a nice bright color you cannot miss today. But appreciate those guys helping with that. It's always great when God's house is full. It does create a problem, though. It can be a difficult thing to find a seat. We know the problem. It's a great problem to have, but it's not one you want to continue with. Uh, unending. So we're working on some options and the uh, Lord continues to, to bless that. We will continue to work on that. But uh, appreciate your uh, dedication to be here and, and be a part of worship today. So we've been studying together the ministry of the church. We are seeking God's plan, his design, his um, desire for the church to be able to accomplish its mission. And we find answers to that, of course, in the Word of God. We do not seek answers in the traditions of men or the opinions of men or even the current and perhaps popular practice of churches. We seek these things in God's word, which is what we ought to do. Jesus made it clear to his disciples that his kingdom would not be like the kingdoms of the world that they were familiar with, where people in power like kings and emperors and masters lorded it over their subjects, ruled them with an iron fist and that kind of thing. Instead, in Jesus' kingdom, he said that the greatest people would be the greatest servants. So whatever God's plan is that we just referred to, at its base is the concept of selfless service. We took some time to trace the church of God in prophecy, especially from the prophet Daniel a couple of weeks ago, where he looked forward to a day when a kingdom would arise that would overcome all other kingdoms. Nothing would ever defeat the kingdom of God, not even death. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The earthly expression of this kingdom turns out to be the church that Jesus built, which he set in motion on the day of Pentecost. We can read about that in Acts chapter 2. And from the beginning, it was full of faithful servants. Last Lord's Day, we looked more carefully at how God organized his church to do ministry. And we studied from Ephesians chapter 4, where there are four or five offices or roles enumerated there by God that he intended to be present and active in his church, including apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors, or sometimes called shepherds, and then also teachers. Uh, some would translate that as shepherds who teach. Some believe that's the, the correct way to look at that text, but we said that uh, this list in Ephesians 4 isn't 100% exhaustive of every role in God's church, but it's sort of a representative list. There are other serving roles uh, named in other places in the New Testament, like, for example, uh, the, the office of deacon. The other important thing that we emphasized was the temporary nature of some of these offices that Paul lists for us. And we studied those temporary roles last time. We talked last time about apostles, 
and prophets. Today we're going to endeavor to look at a couple of the more permanent roles that are listed here. So we're going to talk about evangelists and pastors or shepherds. But before we do, at the risk of being too repetitive, uh, I want us to make sure we do not forget what Paul says to us here in Ephesians 4 about the purpose of all of these roles or offices. The purpose, what they are supposed to accomplish is to help all the rest of us to serve in the kingdom of Jesus. That's what all those other positions, roles, offices, whatever you want to call them, their role is to help all the rest of us to serve. As Paul says it here, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, Ephesians 4, verse 12. And you see, when that happens, the church is built up and it's unified and it grows toward maturity. So there were temporary roles and there are permanent roles. Let's look at a couple of the permanent roles, those we still have among us today in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul here in Ephesians 4 mentions evangelists. What is an evangelist? Well, at its root, uh, it means one who proclaims the good news. Now, by that definition, it really ought to apply to every single Christian, in a sense, if you think about it. I mean, all of us ought in some way to be proclaiming the good news about Jesus Christ, right? 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 In some way, okay? We ought to be telling good news to people about Jesus. It, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to do it before a crowd like this, or it doesn't mean you have to do it in a hostile environment. I mean by that what, what some mission fields are like where it's illegal to do so. It doesn't mean you have to do it on a regular weekly basis like some do, but we all ought to be proclaimers of good news. And of course, Jesus um, himself proclaimed good news. Scripture says that. He was, in that sense, an evangelist. The apostles were all evangelists. This is what they did. And really, when we read about the church in the New Testament, all the New Testament church were, were evangelists in a limited sense. So you're an evangelist, I'm an evangelist, all God's children are evangelists, okay? But here in Ephesians 4, Paul seems to, to point out a special role in the early church, an office, a job, however you want to think of it, of evangelists. And this role continues Unto today, it was not limited to the first century, as was apostle and prophet. Now, the first time that someone seems to be called an evangelist in sort of an official way in the New Testament is a man that's mentioned in Acts chapter 6. If you look at that chapter, maybe you recall what's going on in Acts 6. There are seven men who are chosen to take care of a need that had arisen in the early church. Um, there were some widows, uh, Greek-speaking widows, who were being neglected. Uh, their needs were being neglected for some reason at the time. And so seven men in the church were appointed to make sure that they were taken care of. One of them was a man named Philip. And Philip becomes prominent in that early church and in the storyline of Acts. But over in uh, Acts chapter 21 and verse 8, he is referred to in this way. He is called Philip the Evangelist. And then it says, one of the seven, recalling back to chapter 6. Now, when we read the rest of the material in Acts that, that mentions Philip, it's clear why he would be called the Evangelist. Because uh, you know, it, it's he that leads the evangelistic efforts up in Samaria, which are talked about in chapter 8 of Acts. 
It's he who teaches and baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch in, in chapter 8 as well. And it says at the end of that chapter, that is chapter 8 of Acts, that Philip goes and proclaims good news in every town that he comes to all the way to Caesarea. And so he's stopping in every town and evangelizing. And then, and then we find him in chapter 21 of Acts, now being called Philip the Evangelist. And quite appropriately, don't you think, in light of all the work that he was doing. It, it seems like Philip's main business in the church was to teach and to convert people by proclaiming the good news. That is the work of an evangelist in, in the sense that it's used here in Ephesians 4. Another person that's referred to in this way in God's word is Timothy. Um, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, Paul writes to Timothy uh, there and he says, quote, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Well, again, it's the same, same word that was used back in, in Acts 21, verse 8, but here it's applied to Timothy in his role with the Ephesian church, which is where we believe Timothy was working when he received these letters from Paul. Now, we could take quite a bit of time and, and trace Timothy's work um, and his evangelistic work throughout the New Testament. We would spend time, if we did that, looking at the missionary journeys of Paul. Paul takes three missionary journeys in the book of Acts, and, and Timothy is with him most all of that time. They travel all the way to Rome, preaching good news. And then we find him in Ephesus, as I said, where he receives these two letters from Paul that we quoted from. So these two are, are our examples, Philip and Timothy. Uh, they're the only two that are specifically called evangelists in the New Testament, but there are certainly many others that were doing this work um, that, that were appointed to that role and fulfilled it in their lives. Um, we could name several like this. Some of the names we would know, some maybe not so familiar, but names like Mark and, and Silas and Barnabas and Titus and Luke and Crescens and Gaius and Clement and Tychicus. There's lots of names that seem to have been involved in the work of evangelism and uh, blessed in that way the, the growth of the first century church. So we might summarize the, the role of the evangelist in the New Testament church in this way, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To proclaim the gospel, to teach and convert people to Christ, and also... To, to help them to organize themselves into functioning congregations that follow what the New Testament teaches. That's an important role as well. And that last point um, really directs us to the other role that we want to mention this morning, that of pastors or elders or shepherds, sort of interchangeable terms um, in the New Testament. I'm aware that the, uh, the religious world around us uses some of these terms differently. We are trying to use them as they're revealed in the New Testament. In the New Testament, pastors in churches are always multiple. You, there's a multiplicity of pastors, which could also be called elders, which could also be called shepherds or overseers. We are interested in trying to say things the way the New Testament says them, to the best of our ability, 
and do things to the best of our ability the way the New Testament describes. And so if you hear something that sounds a little bit different than what might be popular, that would be the reason. And we continue to study these things. When we read about the qualifications or maybe better stated the character qualities for New Testament elders, we read about them in the books of 1 Timothy and Titus. I want you to notice that uh, the, these are letters, 1 Timothy and Titus, they're written by the Apostle Paul to evangelists. So Timothy was an evangelist, Titus was an evangelist. And so evangelists are being directed to help the church get organized for ministry. So take, for example, what Paul wrote to Titus, who worked on the island of Crete. That was his place of missionary activity on the island of Crete out in the Mediterranean Sea. Chapter 1 of Titus and verse 5, Paul says why he left Titus there on Crete. He says very specifically, this is why I left you in Crete, Paul writes, so that you might put what remained in the order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Then he goes on and he gives some of the qualifications for elders in verses 6 through 9. We'll get to that in just a second. But who, who is it that is charged with organizing the church on Crete? Titus the evangelist. Okay, We see the same pattern with Timothy. In chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, Paul explains why he left Timothy in Ephesus. He says, he talks about a lot of things there. Um, he, he gives Timothy some instruction on things he needs to be teaching, some false ideas that he needs to be confronting. But eventually, in chapter 3 of that first letter to Timothy, he gets to elders and also to deacons. Again, the, the evangelist Timothy is, is shown the way to make sure that the right people are appointed to these important roles in the church. It wasn't based on who was popular. It wasn't based on who was necessarily prominent. Okay? It was based on them being the right person. So Paul tells us why he's writing to Timothy over in chapter 3, verse 14. 1 Timothy, he says, I am writing these things to you so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So we've seen both with Titus and Timothy what the Apostle Paul was instructing them to do and encouraging them to do. So we find ourselves right now as a congregation at the beginning of a process of trying to follow the New Testament example of seeking out from among ourselves men to serve in the capacity of one of these permanent roles in the New Testament church, elders. In the future, I'm sure, uh, we'll also seek out additional deacons. These are, are not only permanent roles, you see, but, but healthy and growing congregations are always seeking people to fill these roles as they emerge in the church. As these individuals emerge, healthy, dynamic, growing churches seek to have them fill these roles. Scripture doesn't tell us how often to do this. Scripture does not tell us how many you're supposed to appoint when you do it. Okay, so there's some things left to us and our prayerful uh, 
wisdom, guided by the word of God, but it does tell us to do it. As for elders, we have two principal passages that make a formal list of qualifications or character qualities, however you want to uh, refer to them, that we ought to be looking for in these servants. That's what they are primarily, servants, who would also be overseers or pastors or shepherds of the congregation. We have one, again, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we have one in Titus chapter 1. Of course, elders are mentioned a lot of places in the New Testament, a lot of different kinds of texts. Elders are, for instance, uh, one passage said to be called on to, to minister and help those who are sick, to pray for them and, and minister to the sick. Uh, that's in the book of James. Uh, there are times in the book of Acts where elders seem to be uh, setting apart certain men to go to the mission field, laying hands on them as newly commissioned missionaries. So they're mentioned uh, many places. But I just want us today to remind ourselves of what the text says about elders or overseers or pastors all of which refer to the same role. So let's just read the text. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, we'll read through verse 7. Paul to Timothy. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. And then again, in a similar vein, if you just flip over to Titus chapter 1. Beginning at verse 5, this will sound very similar to what we've read, but a little bit of new stuff here. Paul writes to Titus, verse 5, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered quick or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. As I said, when you compare these two, there are a lot of similarities. 
Not surprising since it comes from the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Apostle Paul to write it down. Obviously, we can't go through and won't go through this word for word today, but I just want to quickly note the major qualities that we're looking for in these men who would watch for and lead God's church. What are the major qualities? Good reputation. They need to have a good reputation, not just in the church, but in the community, inside and outside the church. They need to be family men, need to have a wife and children whom they have served and led well and who respect them. Uh, he needs to be moral. He needs to be self-controlled. He needs to be spiritually minded. And he needs to be experienced in Christ. So we're not talking about a brand new Christian. No offense against a brand new Christian. But to be an elder, uh, to be an overseer of God's church, he needs to not be that. He needs to be experienced. And he needs to be a humble, servant-hearted man. Must be a man of his word. And even more importantly, a man of God's word. In short, they're supposed to be solid, experienced Christian men. Perfect men? No. There was only one of those. And he waits for us in heaven. Not perfect in these qualities, but good men who are obviously striving to live like Jesus. Really, what all Christians are supposed to be. You see, uh, but, but these men are appointed to the task of watching out for the souls of the members of God's church, something for which, in fact, they will give account before God. And, and they have this charge to watch over the flock of God. Being an elder over God's church is a worthy and admirable calling. And, and one of the things about it is that whoever they are, they need to have a desire to do it. Okay? That's one of the first qualities mentioned. Uh, it does no good to have to talk a person into doing this, to twist their arm. See, that's not one of the, the, the qualifications is to desire it. But there's a difference between that and, you know, to campaign for it. Not campaigning for the office, but desiring it, aspiring to it in a humble and gracious way. And let me just say something I didn't plan on saying. To, to our young guys here, uh, our young, young guys, this is something you ought to aspire to one day. To serve the Lord in this way. Above all things, let's keep in mind the purpose of the elder's role, as well as all the other offices we've addressed in this series. Again, Ephesians 4, verse 12, purpose is to equip the rest of us in the church to do ministry. So apostles, prophets, evangelists, elders, teachers, all strive to encourage us and to get us to serve one another and to accomplish the kingdom work that we've been called upon to do. Now, we will have more to say about the, uh, the specifics of the selection process as it applies to us here at, at Lancaster, uh, Lord willing, next Sunday morning when we assemble. And uh, we hope to, at that time, turn the first part of the process over to you, the members of the congregation here. And we hope you will... And 
fully expect you will take it seriously and prayerfully. Thank you for listening today. As we conclude, let's ask God's blessings. Our Father, you were so good to us. We thank you that we've had time to honor your name today and hear from your word. Please guide us and be with us in these important days in the history of this congregation. Help us to be wise and to be servant-minded and help us to seek out from among ourselves those who can fulfill these duties. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. It's, it's him we remember, and it's in his name we come to you today. Amen. We're going to sing another song this morning uh, for a time of reflection and perhaps response. If there's any who need prayers or, or need to obey the gospel this morning or, or just need help in some way, this is a time when you can let us know about that. Of course, you can do that after services as well. The invitation of Jesus is always open. We sing this song to get you to think about it. And so let us stand, let us sing.